Section 4 of Philosophical Rudiments Concerning Government and Society by Thomas Hobbes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Geoffrey Church. Chapter 2 of the Law of Nature Concerning Contracts. 1. That the law of nature is not an agreement of men, but the dictate of reason. 2. That the fundamental law of nature is to seek peace, where it may be had, and where not, to defend ourselves. 3. That the first special law of nature is not to retain our right to all things. 4. What it is to quit our right, what to transfer it. 5. That in the transferring of our right, the will of him that receives it is necessarily required. 6. No words but those of the present tense transfer any right. 7. Words of the future, if there be some other tokens to signify the will, are valid in the translation of right. 8. In matters of free gift, our right passeth not from us through any words of the future. 9. The definition of contract and compact. 10. In compacts, our right passeth from us through words of the future. 11. Compacts of mutual faith in the state of nature are of no effect and vain, but not so in civil government. 12. That no man can make compacts with beasts, nor yet with God without revelation. 13. Nor yet make a vow to God. 14. That compacts oblige not beyond our utmost endeavor. 15. By what means we are freed from our compacts. 16. That promises extorted through fear of death in the state of nature are valid. 17. A later compact contradicting the former is invalid. 18. A compact not to resist him that shall prejudice my body is invalid. 19. Compact to accuse oneself is invalid. 20. The definition of swearing. 21. That swearing is to be conceived in that form which he useth that takes the oath. 22. An oath superadds nothing to the obligation which is made by compact. 23. An oath ought not to be pressed, but where the breach of compacts may be kept private, or cannot be punished but from God himself. 1. All authors agree not concerning the definition of the natural law, who notwithstanding do very often make use of this term in the writings. The method, therefore, wherein we begin from definitions and exclusions of all equivocations, is only proper to them who leave no place for contrary disputes. For the rest, if any man say that somewhat is done against the law of nature, one proves it hence, because it was done against the general agreement of all the most wise and learned nations. But this declares not who shall be the judge of the wisdom and learning of all nations. Another hence, that it was done against the general consent of all mankind, which definition is by no means to be admitted. For then it were impossible for any but children and fools to offend against such a law. For sure, under the notion of mankind, they comprehend all men actually endued with reason. These, therefore, either do naught against it, or if they do aught, it is without their own consent, and therefore ought to be excused. But to receive the laws of nature from the consents of them who oftener break than observe them is in truth unreasonable. Besides, men condemn the same things in others which they approve in themselves. On the other side, they publicly commend what they privately condemn, and they deliver their opinions more by hearsay than any speculation of their own, and they accord more through hatred of some object through fear, hope, love, or some other perturbation of the mind, than true reason. And therefore it comes to pass that whole bodies of people often do those things with the greatest unanimity and earnestness, which those writers most willingly acknowledge to be against the law of nature. But since all do grant that is done by right, which is not done against reason, we ought to judge those actions only wrong, which are repugnant to right reason, that is, which contradict 
some certain truth collected by right reasoning from true principles but that which is done wrong we say it is done against some law therefore true reason is a certain law which since it is no less a part of human nature than any other faculty or affection of the mind is also termed natural therefore the law of nature that i may define it is the dictate of right reason footnote by right reason in the natural state of men i understand not as many do an infallible faculty but the act of reasoning that is the peculiar and true ratiocination of every man concerning those actions of his which may either redound to the damage or benefit of his neighbors i call it peculiar because although in a civil government the reason of the supreme that is the civil law is to be received by each single subject for the right yet being without this civil government in which state no man can know right reason from false but by comparing it with his own every man's own reason is to be accounted not only the rule of his own actions which are done at his own peril but also for the measure of another man's reason and such things as do concern him i call it true that is concluding from true principles rightly framed because that the whole breach of the laws of nature consists in the false reasoning or rather folly of those men who see not those duties they are necessarily to perform towards others in order to their own conservation but the principles of right reasoning about such like duties are those which are explained in the second third fourth fifth sixth and seventh articles of the first chapter end of footnote conversant about those things which are either to be done or admitted for the constant preservation of life and members as much as in us lies two but the first and fundamental law of nature is that peace is to be sought after where it may be found and where not there to provide ourselves for helps of war for we showed in the last article of the foregoing chapter that this precept is the dictate of right reason but that the dictates of right reason are natural laws that hath been newly proved above but this is the first because the rest are derived from this and they direct the ways either to peace or self-defence three but one of the natural laws derived from this fundamental one is this that the right of all men to all things ought not to be retained but that some certain rights ought to be transferred or relinquished for if every one should retain his right to all things it must necessarily follow that some by right might invade and others by the same right might defend themselves against them for every man by natural necessity endeavours to defend his body and the things which he judgeth necessarily towards the protection of his body therefore war would follow he therefore acts against the reason of peace that is against the law of nature whosoever he be that doth not part with his right to all things four but he is said to part with his right who either absolutely renounceth it or conveys it to another he absolutely renounceth it who by some sufficient sign or meet tokens declares that he is willing that it shall never be lawful for him to do that again which before by right he might have done but he conveys it to another who by some sufficient sign or meet tokens declares that the other that he is willing it should be unlawful for him to resist it in going about to do somewhat in the performance whereof he might become with right have resisted him but that the conveyance of right consists merely in not resisting is understood by this that before it was conveyed he to whom he conveyed it had even then also a right to all whence he could not give any new right but the resisting right he had before he gave it by reason whereof the other could not freely enjoy his rights is utterly abolished whosoever therefore acquires some right in the natural state of men he only procures himself security and freedom from just molestation in the enjoyment of his primitive right as for example if any man shall sell or give away a farm he utterly deprives himself only from all rights to this farm but he does not so others also five but in the conveyance of right the will is requisite not only of him that conveys but also of him that accepts it if either it be wanting the right remains for if i would have given what was mine to one who refused to accept of it 
i have not therefore either simply renounced my right or conveyed it to any man for the cause which moved me to part with it to this man was in him only not in others too six but if there be no other token extant of our will either to quit or convey our right but only words those words must either relate to the present or time past for if they be of the future only then they convey nothing for example he that speaks thus of the time to come i will give to-morrow declares openly that he yet hath not given it so that all this day his right remains and abides to-morrow too unless in the interim he actually bestows it for what is mine remains mine till i have parted with it but if i shall speak of the time present suppose thus i do give or have given you this to be received to-morrow by these words is signified that i have already given it and that his right to receive it to-morrow is conveyed to him by me to-day seven nevertheless although words alone are not sufficient tokens to declare the will if yet to words relating to the future there shall some other signs be added they may become as valid as if they had been spoken of the present if therefore as by reason of those other signs it appears that he that speaks of the future intends those words should be effectual towards the perfect transferring of his right they ought to be valid for the conveyance of right depends not on words but as hath been instanced in the fourth article on the declaration of the will eight if any man convey some part of his right to another and doth not this for some certain benefit receive or for some compact a conveyance in this kind is called a gift or free donation but in free donation those words only oblige us which signify the present or the time past for if they respect the future they oblige not as words for the reason given in the foregoing article it must needs therefore be that the obligation arise from some other tokens of the will but because whatsoever is voluntarily done is done for some good to him that wills it there can no other token be assigned of the will to give it except some benefit either already received or to be acquired but it is supposed that no such benefit is acquired nor any compact in being for if so it would cease to be a free gift it remains therefore that a mutual good turn without agreement be expected but no sign can be given that he who used future words towards him who was in no sort engaged to return a benefit should desire to have his word so understood as to oblige himself thereby nor is it suitable to reason that those who are easily inclined to do well to others should be obliged by every promise testifying their present good affection and for this cause a promiser in this kind must be understood to have time to deliberate and power to change that affection as well as he to whom he made that promise may alter his desert but he that deliberates is so far forth free nor can be said to have already given but if he promise often and yet give seldom he ought to be condemned of levity and be called not a donor but docent. nine but the act of two or more mutually conveying the rights is called contract but in every contract either both parties instantly perform what they contract for insomuch as there is no trust had from either or to other or the one performs the other is trusted or neither performs where both parties perform presently there the contract is ended as soon as it is performed but where there is credit given either to one or both there the party trusted promiseth after performance and this kind of promise is called a covenant ten but the covenant made by the party trusted with him who hath already performed although the promise be made by words pointing at the future doth no less transfer the right of future time than if it had been made by words signifying the present or time past for the other's performance is a most manifest sign that he so understood the speech of him whom he trusted as that he would certainly make performance also at the appointed time and by this sign the party trusted knew himself to be thus understood which because he hindered not was an evident token of his will to perform the promises therefore which are made for some benefit received which are also covenants are tokens of the will that is 
as in the foregoing section hath been declared of the last act of deliberating whereby the liberty of non-performance is abolished and by consequence are obligatory for where liberty ceaseth there beginneth obligation eleven but the covenants which are made in contract of mutual trust neither party performing out of hand if there arise a just suspicion in either of them are in the state of nature invalid footnote for except there appear some new cause of fear either from somewhat done or some other token of the will not to perform from the other part it cannot be judged to be a just fear for the cause which was not sufficient to keep him from making compact must not suffice to authorize the breach of it being made End of footnote. For he that first performs by reason of the wicked disposition of the greatest part of men studying their own advantage either by right or wrong, exposeth himself to the perverse will of him with whom he hath contracted. For it suits not with reason that any man should perform first, if it be not likely that the other will make good his promise after. Which, whether it be probable or not, he that doubts it must be a judge of, as hath been showed in the foregoing chapter of, in the ninth article thus i say things stand in the state of nature but in the civil state where there is a power which can compel both parties he that hath contracted to perform first must first perform because that since the other may be compelled the cause which made him fear the other's non-performance ceaseth twelve but from this reason in that all free gifts and compacts there is an acceptance of the conveyance of right required it follows that no man can compact with him who doth not declare his acceptance and therefore we cannot compact with beasts neither can we give or take from them any manner of right by reason of their want of speech and understanding neither can any man covenant with god or be obliged to him by vow except so forth as it appears to him by holy scriptures that he hath substituted certain men who have authority to accept of such like vows and covenants as being in god's stead thirteen those therefore do vow in vain who are in the state of nature where they are not tied by any civil law except by most certain revelation the will of god to accept the vow or pact be made known to them for if what they vow be contrary to the law of nature they are not tied by their vow for no man is tied to perform an unlawful act but if what is vowed be commanded by some law of nature it is not their vow but the law itself which ties them but if he were free before his vow either to do it or not to do it his liberty remains because that the openly declared will of the obliger is requisite to make an obligation by vow which in the case propounded is supposed not to be now i call him the obliger to whom any one is tied and the obliged him who is tied fourteen covenants are made of such things only as fall under our deliberation for it can be no covenant without the will of the contractor but the will is the last act of him who deliberates wherefore they only concern things possible and to come no man therefore by his compact obliges himself to an impossibility but yet though we often covenant to do such things as then seem possible when we promise them which yet afterwards appear to be impossible are we not therefore freed from all obligation the reason whereof is that he who promiseth a future in certainty receives a present benefit on condition that he return another for it for his will who performs the present benefit hath simply before it for its object a certain good equally valuable with the thing promised but the thing itself not simply but with condition if it could be done but if it should so happen that even this should prove impossible why then he must perform as much as he can covenants therefore oblige us not to perform just the thing itself covenanted for but our utmost endeavour for this only is the things themselves are not in our power fifteen we are freed from covenants two ways either by performing or by being forgiven by performing for beyond that we oblige not ourselves by being forgiven because he whom we obliged ourselves to by forgiving is conceived to return us that right which we passed over to him for forgiving implies giving 
that is by the fourth article of this chapter a conveyance of right to him to whom the gift is made sixteen it is a usual question whether compacts extorted from us through fear do oblige or not for example if to redeem my life from the power of a robber i promise to pay him one hundred pounds next day and that i will do no act whereby to apprehend and bring him to justice whether i am tied to keep promise or not but though such a promise must sometimes be judged to be of no effect yet it is not to be accounted so because it proceedeth from fear for then it would follow that those promises which reduced men to a civil life and by which laws were made might likewise be of none effect for it proceeds from fear of mutual slaughter that one man submits himself to the dominion of another and he should play the fool finely who should trust this captive covenanting with the price of his redemption it holds universally true that promises do oblige when there is some benefit received and when the promise and the thing promised be lawful but it is lawful for the redemption of my life both to promise and to give what i will of mine own to any man even to a thief we are obliged therefore by promises proceeding from fear except the civil law forbid them by virtue whereof that which is promised becomes unlawful seventeen whosoever shall contract with one to do or omit somewhat and shall after covenant the contrary with another he maketh not the former but the latter contract unlawful for he hath no longer right to do or to admit aught who by former contracts hath conveyed it to another wherefore he can convey no right by latter contracts and what is promised is promised without right he is therefore tied only to his first contract to break which is unlawful eighteen no man is obliged by any contracts whatsoever not to resist him who shall offer to kill wound or any other way hurt his body for there is in every man a certain high degree of fear through which he apprehends that evil which is done to him to be the greatest and therefore by natural necessity he shuns it all he can and it is supposed he can do no otherwise when a man is arrived to this degree of fear we cannot expect but he will provide for himself either by flight or fight since therefore no man is tied to impossibilities they who are threatened either with death which is the greatest evil to nature or wounds or some other bodily hurts are not stout enough to bear them are not obliged to endure them furthermore he that is tied by contract is trusted for faith only is the bond of contracts but they who are brought to punishment either capital or more gentle are fettered or strongly guarded which is a most certain sign that they seem not sufficiently bound from non-resistance by their contracts it is one thing if i promise thus if i do it not at the day appointed kill me another thing if thus if i do it not though you should offer to kill me i will not resist all men if need be contract the first way and there is need sometimes the second way none neither is it ever needful for in the mere state of nature if you have a mind to kill that state itself affords you a right insomuch as you need not first trust him if for breach of trust you will afterwards kill him but in a civil state where the right of life and death and of all corporal punishment is with the supreme that same right of killing cannot be granted to any private person neither need the supreme himself contract with any man patiently to yield to his punishment but only this that no man offered to defend others from him if in the state of nature as between two realms there should a contract be made on condition of killing if it were not performed we must presuppose another contract of not killing before the appointed day wherefore on that day if there be no performance the right of war returns that is a hostile state in which all things are lawful and therefore resistance also lastly by the contract of not resisting we are obliged of two evils to make choice of that which seems the greater for certain death is a greater evil than fighting but of two evils it is impossible not to choose the least by such a compact therefore we should be tied to impossibilities which is contrary to the very nature of compacts nineteen likewise no man is tied by any compacts whatsoever to accuse himself 
or any other by whose damage he is like to procure himself a bitter life wherefore neither is a father obliged to bear witness against his son nor a husband against his wife nor a son against his father nor any man against any one by whose means he hath his subsistence for in vain is that testimony which is presumed to be corrupted by nature but although no man be tied to accuse himself by any compact yet in a public trial he may by torture be forced to make answer but such answers are no testimony of the fact but helps for the searching out of truth so that where whether the party tortured his answer be true or false or whether he answer not at all whatsoever he doth he doth it by right twenty swearing is a speech joined to a promise whereby the promiser declares his renouncing of god's mercy unless he perform his word which definition is contained in the words themselves which have in them the very essence of an oath to wit so god help me or the other equivalent as with the romans do thou jupiter so destroy the deceiver as i slay the same beast neither is this any let but that an oath may as well sometimes be affirmatory as promissory for he that confirms his affirmation with an oath promiseth that he speaks truth but though in some places it was the fashion for subjects to swear by their kings that custom took its original hence that those kings took upon them divine honour for oaths were therefore introduced that by religion and consideration of divine power men might have a greater dread of breaking their faiths than that wherewith they fear men from whose eyes their actions may lie hid twenty one whence it follows that an oath must be conceived in that form which he useth who takes it for in vain is any man brought to swear by a god whom he believes not and therefore neither fears him for though by the light of nature it may be known that there is a god yet no man thinks he is to swear by him in any other fashion or by any other nature than which is contained in the precepts of his own proper that is as he who swears imagines the true religion twenty two by the definition of an oath we may understand that a bare contract obligeth no less than that to which we are sworn for it is the contract which binds us the oath relates to the divine punishment which it could not provoke if the breach of contract were not in itself unlawful but it could not be unlawful if the contract were not obligatory furthermore he that renounceth the mercy of god obligeth himself not to any punishment because it is ever lawful to deprecate the punishment howsoever provoked and to enjoy god's pardon if it be granted the only effect therefore of an oath is this to cause men who are naturally inclined to break all manner of faith through fear of punishment to make the more conscience of their words and actions twenty three to exact an oath where the breach of contract if any be made cannot but be known and where the party compacted withal wants not the power to punish is to do somewhat more than is necessary unto self-defence and shows a mind desirous not so much to benefit itself as to prejudice another for an oath out of the very form of swearing is taken in order to the provocation of god's anger that is to say of him that is omnipotent against those who therefore violate their faith because they think that by their own strength they can escape the punishment of men and of him that is omniscient against those who therefore usually break their trust because they hope that no man shall see them end of section four recording by geoffrey church